Welcome to the New Jersey Bank Marketing Association's 2008 Economic Outlook. Our keynote speaker is Dr. Joseph Seneca from Rutgers University. This program was recorded December 6, 2007 in Woodbridge, New Jersey. I'm your host, Steve Lubetkin. Now let's go to the lectern where Dennis Kane of Amboy Bank will introduce today's program. Good morning, my name is Dennis Kane and I'd like to welcome everyone to today's um, New Jersey Bank Marketing's uh, 19th annual forecast meeting. Uh, back in 1988, uh, our group got together and one of the first meetings we decided to have was a forecast meeting. And back then, our speakers talked about uh, their idea of where banks were going, bank products, regulations, technology, and of course the economy. Who, do, who would have known back then? Uh, when we take a look at the banks that were around, um, certainly most of them aren't, aren't here today. As bank marketers, our role is to keep on top of the ever-changing environment and manage the marketing disciplines for our banks. Our associates also do that. What I'd like to do also is thank the committee. It's a lot of work putting these together for the last almost 20 years. And um, I'd especially like to thank uh, four people who have been part of the original committee. Uh, Jerry Lind, who uh, registers everything. Uh, Dave Block, who's sitting in the back also. Jerry Nussbaum. And... Um, Oh, and me. Okay. <laughs> I knew there were four of us. Uh, it's kind of interesting when you think about um, how we started, and certainly the bank I was with back then isn't here now, but our associates in the advertising agencies all are the same agencies. So maybe that has a little something to say about the staying power for our, our associates and, and banks themselves. We'd also like to thank our sponsors who really allow us to bring these meetings to you at a reasonable cost. Um, Jerry's done a wonderful job listing the sponsors all along the wall. Um, Marty Rubin, who's one of our sponsors and also a board member, um, is in charge of sponsors. So he certainly lives up to uh, his job and he becomes a sponsor himself. If you would like to sponsor one of the meetings, just see Marty, who's in the back of the room. Um, we are part of the Pender Jurdell chapter uh, we're just a New Jersey committee. If anyone would like to uh, join Pendredell, which has, has their meetings out of Philadelphia, uh, you can just see me after the meeting. Um, the other thing when we talk about technology, um, this, is the, um, <clears throat> this is the eighth meeting that we've had a podcast for. And um, podcasts are unusual, but we list our podcast on our website. We also have a website which certainly didn't exist back in 1988. And anyone who wants to view the past meetings can certainly go to our website, njbankmarketing.com, and uh, view the last eight meetings. We have uh, three outstanding speakers today. And uh, one of the speakers, Dr. Seneca, is going for George Tabor's record of four meetings. We're honored to have Dr. Seneca here for three years now. And if anybody wants to know what he said last year, you can certainly go to the podcast. And he told us not to say that. Um, speaking of podcasts, I'd just like to introduce Steve Lebeckin, who has volunteered putting these together. The last podcast was the first one we actually have a video of also. Steve, maybe you could just explain a little bit about podcasts and how they work. And Thanks, Dennis. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Um, and appreciate the opportunity to give you the 10-second pitch on podcasting. Podcasts are nothing more than audio or video programs that are distributed using Internet technology. We distribute them on the njbankmarketing.com website, as Dennis said. We also distribute them using a technology called RSS feeds, which allows people to subscribe to a podcast series and be alerted whenever new content is made available. So if anyone has any interest in podcasting, we have some literature in the back of the room. You can visit our website, which is professionalpodcasts.com, uh, and I'll be happy to talk to anybody about any uh, questions you might have about podcasting. It's not as expensive to do as you might think. It looks very complicated, but we like to make it look complicated so that you'll hire us to do it for you. Um, at this point, I'd like to introduce Jane Gore from Amboy Bank, who will open today's program. Thanks very much.
Good morning. Um, hopefully we'll have some more people. I hear there's some pretty good traffic. Uh, it was from the north, now it's from the south, but it's New Jersey, so whatever. Um, it is my pleasure and to introduce Dr. Seneca, who's been most gracious to take my phone calls once a year and be very gracious to accept. Um, I really look forward to some of the information this year. Um, we had some interesting things in our economy. Dr. Seneca is, besides being a professor at Rutgers, um, is chairman of the New Jersey Council of Economic Advisors. As I said, a Rutgers professor at the Edward Blaustein School of Planning and Public Safety. You prepare a semi-annual economic outlook for the governor and the legislature and uh, advise them on economic policies and business developments. Um, you're also an author of numerous articles, reports, books on economic policy, public finance, environmental, um, and state economic development. Uh, you were named 2002 the Educator of the Year by the Development Council of New Jersey. Congratulations, a couple years later. And it is with tremendous pleasure that I introduce you again today. Thank you. Again, as Jane said, um, this is the fourth year in my business. That makes me a senior. So I expect to graduate uh, on time uh, this, uh, this coming year. But it is terrific to be back here, and happy holidays to everyone. These are indeed uh, interesting times is one word for them. And my task today to set the stage for the discussion within your industry is to look at the national and the New Jersey economies and where we are and where uh, we may be going. All that is, uh, as I said, a very uncertain picture. So again, it's a pleasure to be with you, and I really look forward to discussing your perspectives of where you see the state and the national economies. I'm an economist. I look at data. It's sort of like looking at the economy from 30,000 feet up. and You see patterns and trends and comparisons, particularly New Jersey versus other states. <coughs> Uh, you are involved daily in the nitty-gritty, frontline, daily workings of the economy and have a much better and current feel for, for what's going on. So these are indeed very uncertain times with growth in the national economy expected to slow significantly this quarter and well into next year. The confluence of a slowing national economy and the presidential election year sets the stage for a truly interesting, if rhetoric-laden, 2008. My title today, I thought I'd give a title to the presentation to express this deep uncertainty of the current economic environment is, namely, what happens when the easy credit runs out. The economy now faces a continuing deep slump in the housing market, an ensuing credit crunch from that, paradoxically characterized by falling interest rates but harder to obtain credit, high energy prices, and very large but still not fully known write-offs of bad debt in major banks and financial businesses, both in this country and abroad, caused by the subprime mortgage debacle. We have school districts in Florida not able to meet their payroll because they have owned this paper, and we have towns in Norway uh, finding out that their investments in this paper have gone bad and everywhere in between and not clear what else. Let's begin by examining the condition and outlook for the national economy, which is, after all, and particularly this year, the ultimate driver for what will be occurring in our state. The current national economic expansion began in November 2001 and thus, as of this month, is now 74 months old, or just over six years. For perspective, it's worthwhile to note that the average length of the preceding nine post-World War II economic expansions in this country uh, has been 59 months. So our current expansion at 74 months and counting is in its mature phase. It's also worthwhile to note, however, that the New Jersey expansion of the 1980s, which, by the way, ended with a housing sector collapse, lasted 83 months, 
and the New Jersey expansion of the 1990s, the all-time record, lasted a super long 102 months. So despite the averages, the current New Jersey expansion could still continue for a long time if the previous two expansions are its role models. Whether the current expansion challenges those previous two cycles for longevity will be determined by the performance of the national economy. What is different this time compared to other periods when economic growth slowed is that the typical pattern was for, in that previous to the slowing, inflation to accelerate and the Fed to increase interest rates and consumer spending in the housing sector to experience a decrease in demand from higher interest costs, thus slowing the economy, often in anticipation of trying to avoid an overheated economy. Now, instead, the Fed is lowering rates but the excesses of aggressive mortgage lending on a vast scale to receptive borrowers along with the use of exotic mortgage instruments, no down payment, all interest, and no, lax, credit chats, lax, lax credit standards, adjustable rate mortgages, and the packaging and sale of vast quantities of such loans throughout the financial markets of the world to those seeking ever higher returns, all that has imploded leaving the wreckage of rising foreclosures, falling home equity values, a collapse in sales for new and existing homes, and a credit crunch not only for residential, uh, resident, for residential borrowers, but for businesses as financial firms continue to absorb significant losses. The, the national growth in real, that is inflation-adjusted gross domestic product, that is the total output of all newly produced goods and services, has been mixed. In the first quarter of 2006, okay, that's almost two years ago, real GDP increased by 5.6%, a very healthy number. However, in the next four quarters after that, that is through the first quarter of this year, 2007, growth fell to just under 2% well below the long-term trend of the U.S. economy of 3%, and that included the very tepid 0.6% growth in the first quarter of this year. But then, in the second quarter of this year, real GDP strengthened considerably to a 3.8% pace and accelerated even further to a 4.9% growth rate in the third quarter, led by exports, about 20% growth, business spending on capital goods and technology, almost over 9 percent, federal spending associated with the war, 7 percent, and higher inventories in this last quarter. Consumption spending this last quarter rose at 2.7 percent pace, and that was a pickup from the rather tepid 1.4 percent growth rate in the second quarter. And it is this key component going forward, consumption spending in real terms, which has now risen for 91, 91 consecutive corners, count them, 91 quarters. And the critical question is, will it keep growing? Given the present alignment, the present alignment of a very potent triple threat, falling home equity values, tightening credit standards, and high energy prices, all of which represent burdens on the consumer. The national economy, through the first 10 months of 2007, that's through October, has generated 1.2 million new jobs. In the same 10-month period of 2006, that is through October 2006, the national economy generated 1.8 million new jobs. Thus, employment growth is down by about a third this year compared to last and is likely to slow further. This deceleration, not negative numbers, but a deceleration in job growth in combination with the credit constraints from the subprime lending problems led the Federal Reserve to reduce the federal funds rates by 50 basis points at the end of the summer, the first rate cut since June 2003, and reduced it again recently by another 25 basis points to its current 4.5 percent rate. All eyes are again focused on the forthcoming Fed meeting next week, uh, where it's anticipated the Fed will cut rates again. The sharp volatility that we observe in the bond and equity markets continues as traders and investors carefully, carefully parse out federal uh, 
board members' statements for clues of direction. By the way, the financial term volatility is the nice word for white knuckle roller coaster ride as we see swings of 200 to 300 points each day uh, in the last month, depending on events and depending on who says what. The question is, can the Fed engineer a soft landing via these timely interest rate cuts and large injections of liquidity into credit markets and achieve a slow growth but no recession outcome given the issues facing the national economy? The recession scenario, here's the scenario. It's not happened yet, but here's the scenario and the concerns. The recession scenario goes as follows. The housing sector continues to slump. In fact, home prices, according to probably the best price index available, the Case-Shiller price index for repeat sales of the same units, same sales units, probably the best price index for housing fell by 4.5% in the third quarter this year compared to a third quarter a year ago in 20 U.S. housing markets. All, all the markets showed a decline. That was the steepest drop since the index began being uh, recorded in 1988. At the same time, sales of existing single-family homes in October were 20 percent below the sales of a year ago. And the number of homes for sale rose to a 10.8 month supply at the current sales rate, almost 11 months. Uh, that was a level not reached since May 1989, the previous housing sector collapse. Sales of new homes have similarly plummeted, down 23 percent in September. Uh, compared to a year ago, and builders have scrambled to add amenities and reduce prices. Witness the recent national discounts of 20 percent or more offered by Hovnanian in order to reduce their new home inventories. The number of home foreclosure filings in October were 94 percent higher than a year ago. Also, over $360 billion, billion dollars in adjustable rate mortgages will reset in 2008 and another $85 billion will reset this quarter, fourth quarter 07, all at much higher interest rates, thus potentially draining consumer spending. To reduce the impact of this, President Bush is going to announce today uh, a plan that would freeze mortgage rates for a sizable number of these homeowners facing these resets. The large scale of these forthcoming resets almost all of which are held by subprime borrowers, sets the stage for potential further increases in foreclosures. Obviously, each foreclosure at its, ext at its extreme form, when it's actually repossessed, uh, adds inventory to the housing market. But the tightening of lending standards that has accompanied this has also meant reduced lending to prime borrowers and reduced contract, reduced home sales in general. Moreover, since, as I said, almost all of the subprime lending was to finance first-time home buyers, and this lending has now dried up completely, it means that for each subprime mortgage now not made, about four other contract home sales do not occur as the chain of sales that results from the sale to a first-time buyer is broken. And somebody keeps trading up because the person selling to the first-time buyer is buying. So it's on a one to four basis. Thus, again, this is the scenario with little expectation of a turnaround until home prices fall further, affecting consumer confidence and consumer equity, and home demand responds to the lower prices. The recession scenario says the consumer confidence would continue to erode, and this will negatively affect consumer spending, the linchpin of the U.S. economy. Add to this $90 a barrel plus of oil, that's up almost 60 percent from the $53 a barrel what it was a year ago, and the combined threat to spending is formidable. Note that consumer spending represents approximately 70 percent, 70 percent of gross domestic product, and thus is a very large component uh, for the growth of the national economy, and also that the U.S. consumer supports the world economy as a major source of demand for other countries' exports. Thus, a slowdown, or worse, an actual decline, which we have not seen in consumer spending in the U.S., will negatively affect the world economy as well. At the same time, credit constraints are not confined to tighter mortgage lending standards, but are also affecting businesses. The two leading sources of business credit, commercial and industrial bank loans, commercial paper, peaked at $3.3 trillion in lending in August. 
but have fallen to $3 trillion this month, an almost unprecedented decline of 9%. This constrains business act investment activity going forward, adding to the potential for a sharper slowdown. Thus, after a long, long era of cheap and readily available money, the era of easy credit is over for both consumers and businesses. Whether the economy continues to grow, grow going forward or the recession scenario just outlined above becomes a reality will depend on the balance between any further slowing in consumer spending. And the latest data show that consumer spending is holding up uh, quite remarkably, along with the combined stagnation in residential investment and the effects of these credit constraints that I've just outlined versus the extent of offsetting positive growth from exports, very strong, government spending, and business investment. The dollar's weakness, uh, anybody traveling, take your vacation in the United States this year. I, I'm, I'm married to a Brit. My wife's English. When she goes visits her mother, I tell her she's a leading indicator for the collapse of the dollar. Every time she goes, the dollar's at an all-time low. We've never had as many British visitors to our house in the last year than in the previous 20 years. They see America as a giant fire sale. They can't believe the prices, that, but it's globalization. They're here changing their strong pound for weak dollars to go to New York to buy Chinese goods. Uh, I mean, it is, it is really a wonderful global economy. Um, the dollar's depreciation, about 8% over the past year on a trade-weighted basis, along with higher oil prices, however, raises the risk of inflation even at a time when the economy is slowing, and that's the Fed's dilemma via higher import prices and higher energy prices. And the decline in the dollar also raises the significant concern that foreign lenders with vast holdings of dollars may at last, hasn't happened, sell these dollars, putting pressure on U.S. interest rates. Last year, the U.S. trade deficit was $764 billion, billion dollars one year, all financed by borrowing from foreign sources. Another key factor for the economy is the future direction of employment, very key. If jobs, and this is the key, can continue to grow, then income grows, consumer confidence doesn't uh, collapse, and consumer spending continues. So tomorrow's payroll employment report from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, just ahead of next week's Fed's meeting, will be a critical factor for whether and by how much the Fed will reduce interest rates next week. Uh, the, the consensus forecast is for an 80,000 job growth number next tomorrow. But the ADP data in advance of that, uh, which they run a separate uh, store, uh, account, showed about a, almost a 200,000 job growth just today. So it may be that we may have a very strong job record, report next uh, tomorrow, uh, well, in, well in advance, well in greater than the uh, advanced estimates by, the, by economists. And that may affect the Fed next week. And if the Fed hesitates, then you're going to see the market go down by two or 300 points. And that's that white knuckle roller coaster. And then we don't know what uncertain, what the next, uh, you know, where the, the subprime bad uh, paper is going to show up next. Florida, Norway, Citibank, uh, what's next? So let's now turn to the New Jersey economy and review where it is and where it is heading. First, the good news, and there is good news. Employment in the state is at uh, an all-time high. There were uh, 4,107,000 payroll jobs in New Jersey. These are jobs in New Jersey as of October 07. That's the latest data available from the State Department of Labor. This total is 144,400 jobs higher than the level of employment in March 2003, the trough of the last recession. In 2006, employment in New Jersey grew by 33,900 jobs, up from the tepid job gain of about 28,200 jobs in 2005. There was encouraging growth in 2006 of 13,600 jobs in professional and business services particularly in the high-end salary subcategory of the management of companies. There was also growth of 2,200 jobs in the information sector, a sector that had been losing jobs in New Jersey for some years as competition, deregulation, and mergers stressed what had been a bedrock 
high technology jewel of the New Jersey economy. Think of AT&T, Bell Labs, Lucent, all now very much diminished in New Jersey. The state's unemployment rate is at a very low 4.1 percent in October. That's approaching levels that we had not seen since 2000, the end of the last economic boom in the late 1990s. There is further good news, in fact even better news with respect to income. New Jersey has the second highest household income in the nation, that's as of 2006, $64,470, and that's 32 percent, almost a third above the national average, trailing only Maryland. The latest income data for the state, that is as of the second quarter 2007, indicates that total personal income in New Jersey grew by 5.6 percent from the second quarter of 2006. That was below the U.S. growth rate of 6.4 percent, but this is still a very solid number because we've achieved it despite a much slower growing population in New Jersey. Total income is, a, you know, not only incomes grow, but how many people uh, affect that. Population growth in New Jersey is only two-tenths of a percent last year versus uh, one percent growth last year for population nationally. The scale and the density of New Jersey's income employment concentrations are extraordinarily impressive. If the 11 county northern and central New Jersey area, that is the area from Bergen County in the north to Monmouth County in the east to Somerset and Middlesex County here in the south and to Hunterdon County in the west was designated by the U.S. Bureau of Census as a metropolitan area by itself. It's not. It's all carved up. Part of it is in the New York metropolitan area. Part is in the Pennsylvania metropolitan area. We don't get a picture of New Jersey from the U.S. Bureau of Census because it's all carved up into the Philadelphia and New York markets. But if that area, if you take those numbers for those 11 counties, it would be the fourth largest metropolitan area in the country in terms of population, 6 million residents, the fifth largest in terms of total jobs, 3.6 million jobs, the fourth largest in terms of annual personal income, $270 billion, and the fifth largest in terms of commercial office space, 210 million square feet. It is not surprising that New Jersey continues to be a highly sought after location as a consumer market of enormous breadth and depth. So the good side of the New Jersey economic story is that our business profile is overrepresented in the high value added business sectors of finance, your business, information, telecom, and this broad category of business and professional services. They have in New Jersey one of every four workers, uh, almost 25 percent. Uh, state employment, as I said, is at an all time high. New Jersey's income growth has been solid. And the core economy of New Jersey is of enormous size in depth in terms of jobs and purchasing power. However, there are symmetrical concerns about the growth in that high level economy, distinguished between the level and the growth in the economy. First, New Jersey employment growth is distinct from the level of employment has been slow. Last year, the state's employment growth was 0.8%. That was less than half the national employment growth rate of 1.7 percent. And now, with the slowdown in the U.S. economy that I just described, the state's job markets are likely to remain soft and tepid. So far this year, through October, the state has added 18,100 private sector jobs. That's a growth rate of 0.5 percent, while the nation's in private employment sector growth rate has been 0.9 percent. New Jersey's private sector employment is only 21,800 jobs above what it was 82 long months ago in December 2000, the peak of the last business cycle. Peak to date, December 2000 to date, plus 21,800 private sector jobs. This slow growth in jobs suggests that job generating investment decisions are not on balance being made in favor of New Jersey. Also, the composition of the job growth we have had since 2000, despite some very encouraging gains this past year in information, 
and business and professional services has been dominated by increases in jobs in health care, leisure and hospitality, and other personal services, and in state and local government. In contrast to the more balanced growth job in jobs of the 97-2000 period. These two conditions of slow employment growth and imbalances in the composition of job growth are not specific to New Jersey, but are general to most of the states in the northeast region of the country. In fact, national job creation, 7.5 million jobs in the first quarter of 2007, now be careful, that's gross job creation, has been much slower uh, in this economic expansion than in the previous economic expansions of the 80s and 90s. Remember, the number of new jobs reported each month, tomorrow's announcement, and the equivalent announcement for when the state makes its announcement is the net amount of jobs. Jobs created minus jobs eliminated. So those two components, jobs created and jobs eliminated, are very large. It's the net difference that gets measured. But if you look at just the jobs created, that's been much slower nationally in, the, in this decade than in the previous good times of the 80s and the 90s. And the, the key to job growth then is to generate new job creation because market forces, and you know this well, technology, foreign competition, cost pressures are always, always eliminating jobs. The key is to create the new next big thing. Also, there are disturbing population trends in New Jersey. Last year, New Jersey was surpassed by North Carolina in terms of total population. This knocked New Jersey out of the top 10 states for the first time in modern U.S. history. Despite the sense of congestion and high population densities that we all feel daily, right? Ever try to make a left-hand turn in New Jersey? You know what I mean. The state's population growth has been slowing markedly. Population growth has three components. The rate of natural increase, births minus deaths. The rate of international migration, the number of people moving into New Jersey from abroad minus the number of people moving from New Jersey to abroad, and the rate of internal, what the census calls domestic migration, the number of people moving into New Jersey from other states minus the number of people moving from New Jersey to other states. New Jersey's overall population growth is positive, and it's positive due to the first two of those components but both the absolute gain in population and its rate of increase, that is the percentage change, have slowed significantly in this decade. In 2002, New Jersey's total population growth, that is the net result of all three of those components, was 79,184, plus 79,184. Since then, the annual increase has declined steadily to a gain of only 21,410 people this last year, 2006. The reason for this decline has been the acceleration in internal domestic out-migration. That is, there has been a substantial increase in the net number of people leaving New Jersey for other states. Net internal out-migration was a negative 23,759 persons in 2002. That number has increased steadily every year since and in the latest year of data, 2006, the net outflow was 72,547. So we went from minus 23 annually to minus 72 in good economic times. We've had out migration before, but always in recessions. To many in New Jersey, the slowdown in population growth is a welcome sign of possible reduced congestion and less pressure for sprawl and development. However, it is very important to understand the causes of such a trend. First, how much is due to being pushed and why and how much is due to being pulled. And second, who is leaving and who is coming? Empty nesters, young workers, what is that mix? And we, and we don't know. Whatever the composition of this accelerating net out migration, it raises some cautionary flags. A recent Rutgers report that I've done with my colleagues on out migration trends is available on your table. And if there are not enough copies to go around and you want one, if you give me your card, I'll, I'll send one to you. What about the state's commercial real estate markets? New York City has become the economic dynamo for the region, a role that New Jersey performed in the 1980s and 1990s. Downtown Manhattan has come back very strongly from 9-11.
Goldman Sachs has a new headquarters building going up. J.P. Morgan Chase has decided to build there, and not in Mid Midtown. Rents in downtown are approximately $70 per square foot for Class A uh, in downtown, Class A office space, and they are much higher in Midtown. New York City is attracting construction capital and office space demand from all over the world. With commercial rents for Class A space around $30 to $35 per square foot in Jersey City, New York's office boom offers a potentially large boost to New Jersey's commercial office markets as the rent differentials, differentials have now become very attractive for a New Jersey location. As of the third quarter, 2007, there was about 21 million square feet of Class A office space available. That's for direct supplement in the 11 county north central New Jersey area region that I described. The vacancy rate was about 18% on a base of about 117 million square feet. There was an absorption, net absorption positive, of 3,660,000 mi square feet in the first three quarters of 2007 in that 11 county area, with a pickup in activity on the Hudson waterfront, as expected, and right in the area around here, around Metro Park in, in, in Middlesex County. However, the vacancy rate remains a stubborn, the stubborn 18% for the entire Levin County area, and it remains to be seen going forward where the New York real estate boom will continue given the mortgage lending and credit constraints affecting the financial sector. The housing market in New Jersey has reflected national conditions. In 2006, residential building permits in New Jersey declined by 18% compared to 2005 as the housing slump hit inevitably New Jersey. In the first nine months of 2007, the latest data available, 18,107 new residential permits have been issued in New Jersey. That's down 26 percent over the same nine-month period in 2006. Housing sales in New Jersey in October are down by 13 percent from October 2006 that's contract sales, new and existing units. And there is a 13-month supply of homes on the market. With entry-level home demand significantly reduced by the loss in affordability that brought us this problem initially, house prices outstripping income gains for the first five, six years of the decade, and the sharp credit tightening now at all levels, at all buying levels, the outlook for housing in New Jersey, like for the nation, is subdued. Overall, New Jersey's economy is strong and well-balanced, its workforce highly educated and highly productive. The state's high income levels and attractive quality of life in its many municipalities are enormous incentives for businesses and individuals to locate, live, and work here. But New Jersey needs sustained and significant attention to ensure that it remains this way, controlling property taxes, investing in economic growth, improving transportation infrastructure, and restoring business confidence are key areas requiring effective action. You've been an attentive and gracious audience, and I look forward briefly to, to your comments and assessments from your perspective of the national and state conditions and prospects. Thank you. Okay, questions? Comments. It's first period class. It's always there on the morning, right? I, know. <laughs> I think we're all scared. You mentioned the dollar. Um, hearing about maybe oil going off the dollar. What's your your future prediction on direction of the I mean, dollar? That's 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 been the big unknown. The, the dollar has lost significant value, and and that's helped the U.S. economy. If we hadn't had that big spurt in exports because of the dollar depreciation. It, I mean, manufacturing is doing incredibly well. Agriculture is doing pretty well because of the, the relative terms of trade. But we have rap stars and, uh, and other stars now requesting to be paid in euros. Uh, euro is $1.40. It was 86 cents for a, a euro four or five years ago. Uh, those major national governments, China and Japan, which have enormous holdings of dollars, see the value of those holdings going down. Oil is priced in dollars. That puts pressure up on energy prices simply to keep the, the real value of what that oil represents to the producers. 
Uh, the key question, and it's not happened yet, is will there be a rush out of dollars by all those foreign governments and other interests that hold dollars? If so, that's a very, uh, very difficult situation because that will put great upward pressure on interest rates. As of now, it hasn't happened. Yes, could, could you identify yourself so I get a sense of... Local taxes have certainly been a huge issue in the state. And over the past few mm. years... To try and reduce the cost in the municipalities, mm. um, it doesn't seem like anyone's willing to do that. Do you see that happening at all, or is that even possible in the future? Sure. I mean, the issue is, as we all know, is property tax. I mean, property taxes in New Jersey, I mean, obviously it's been the focus for public sector discussion for for years that the governor has been in, involved with trying to get uh, a, a whole portfolio of policies through the legislature, and he has, that attempts to reduce the rate of increase in property taxes. 566 municipalities in New Jersey, 566 municipalities, okay? Um, all of them with you know, very attractive places to live. I live in one of them, Madison. Uh, down the road is Chatham, two high schools two fire departments, two police services, and I don't want to merge with Chatham. I like my local services. I like my school district. I like knowing the cops. And this is the way we all feel. Uh, but also, please, by the way, cut my property taxes. It's a disconnect. The governor has offered a program to provide incentives to municipalities. I think you've got to do it with carrots, not sticks, to try to look at, at uh, cost sharing service sharing, and he's, there, there's some progress being made there. But that, I mean, it's subject to individual local control, and so it's going to be a long process. I think it's a needed policy. I think the incentive approach is good. To expect immediate results from that is probably optimistic, but as one element of a large policy to try and reduce the rate of increase in local costs, I think it's necessary and important and can be effective over time. It will work for those municipalities that want to do it. I mean, my son lives in North Carolina. He's one of those out migrants. Uh, one school district, Charlotte, Mecklenburg counties. The whole county is a school district. Uh, you put that same geographic area here, you would have how many school districts? Hundreds. Uh, it's a different way. Uh, being able to change that is very difficult. Because, as I say, we're, we like our high-quality Cadillac services but we want to do it with uh, low property taxes. It's a difficult issue, Dennis. Yeah, doctor, my name is Jim Kerr. Uh, I, I recently what, what write bank, something. Jim, or what, what business? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a private consultant. Okay. Um, I recently read something that surprised me. Um, as a result of the NAFTA agreement, and we're talking about the value of, of the dollar recently, there is some discussions going on about a common currency for North and North America. Canadian dollar, U.S. dollar, and the Mexican peso coming up with something called the Amero. What do you know about that? Well, it would be, the, it would be modeled on the European Union, which tried to, which has, has, has a single central bank and a single currency, the euro, for most of the, most of the countries in Europe. We'd be the weakest link in that chain right now. That would be and then, and a, stunning, a stunning statement to make. Uh, the Canadian dollar is above par with the U.S. dollar, and the Mexican peso is, is, is okay. Uh, the, I, I don't know, to coordinate, I mean, the U.S. economy is so large and so dominant compared to those other two, it's essentially would be, a, you know, again, a dollar-denominated currency. Are, are the, the, the purpose behind the single coordinated currency in Europe and single central bank was to eliminate trade barriers so that there's a free flow of capital and people and businesses within that European Union. NAFTA essentially does that, and there's pretty good free trade with Canada. I don't think that the barriers that we have for that as an economic entity were what they were in Europe. And so I suspect that's uh, not going to happen. Frank Orofino with Boiling Springs Savings Bank. I'm the chief credit officer of the company. You would indicate that the New Jersey economy is um, growing at a significant certain rate. I'm specifically concerned about the income growth, and I believe you said that the income growth is positive yes. for growing, you know, it's not a bunch of $10 an hour jobs. 
Oh, I didn't say that. No, oh. I didn't say that. I okay, said because that's that's total, what total hmm. personal. Just go ahead. Please. No, no, I'm sorry. Finish. Yeah. No, good. Uh, to the extent that what we're seeing in applications, though, is just the reverse of that. Is our um, income analysis appears to be declining, not increasing. In terms of individual income Earn circumstances of applicants for credit from that's your correct. institution, yes. That's correct. Yeah. Well, the income I referred to was total personal income in the states, the total. Average income is also rising. Average per capita income, average per household income is also rising. And the total is rising at rates that are close to the national rate, which is surprising because of the slower growing population. Uh, but the composition of jobs may be, is, is change, is not, the high paying job growth is not what it was in the, as it, in the 90s as it is now. And uh, that's, that may be what you're seeing, some of that. Uh, the other issue is the concentration of the high income taxpayers in New Jersey makes the state very vulnerable to any downturns in, in financial markets. One percent of the New Jersey tax filers for the New Jersey gross income tax, the GIT. One percent of the filers generate 40 percent of the revenue. So when you have, uh, and that, all that is coming from very high income individuals, when you have significant uh, uh, decline in financial sector incomes, you, as we did in 2001, you see a sharp decline in New Jersey gross income tax revenues, and then we have problems. That hasn't happened yet, but you know, in fact, income tax revenues are growing, growing quite strongly. I mean, capital gains this year will probably New Jersey. You know, New Jersey, when you fill out your tax, it's gross income tax, right? It's gross. I mean, you, you have a capital gain, New Jersey purposes, it's treated as ordinary income. So when the market is going up and down, by the way, when the market goes up and down, there's lots of trades, so people are taking gains and losses. That's going to be reflected. I think we're going to have a good, strong year, and, and maybe, for that, simply because of, of the churn. But what will happen over time is, is some vulnerability there. It's interesting that your observation is interesting on what you're seeing on, that, on, the, on average incomes on your applicants. Hi. Freddie Silverman, Strategy. I'm a public relations specialist. I have a question. You said your son was from South Carolina. No, no, he's in, he, lived, he lives in North Carolina. Okay. My question is... Don't people in North Carolina and South Carolina and Florida send their children to college? It seems to me that, yes, we have big infrastructure, but education obviously is the motivator of higher property taxes in our state. How do the other states deal with funding education, and why can't it work for New Jersey? I'm not the, the expert on that, but uh, New Jersey supports its schools at the number one rate per pupil in the country. New Jersey's expenditures per pupil, by choice, the collective expenditures over all those school districts, and with significant court-mandated expenditures from Abbott v. Burke, have meant that New Jersey's public school expenditures per pupil are number one in the country. You put that on top of five, not, not 566, 566 municipalities, 616 school districts. You have more school districts and municipalities. So that combination has led to very high uh, per pupil costs, which are funded through property taxes and state aid, where the state aid is supported by the income tax and the sales tax. So we have chosen for high costs and high quality. Uh, John McWeeny, New Jersey Bankers. Uh, as you might suspect, I spent a lot of time with bankers and uh, had dinner the other night with some CEOs, and one of the topics of conversation at, at dinner was uh, they're all seeing a lot of their more affluent uh, customers change their residence from New Jersey to Florida. And um, they say that's a real prominent trend, and, and they're concerned about it. And he, it's probably included in your study here, but if you could comment on that. It's a possible, one possible cause. The anecdotes that you hear, we've heard we continually, and it stems from the 8.9% top marginal income tax rate for incomes over $500,000. And uh, the, the, the tax strategies that follow from that. Uh, we've heard similar things, and I think, you know, it's, that's been what's been uh, going on in terms of people have been saying that. There's, there are no good data to show 
that in, in the aggregate yet, but that's that tax advice strategy we've heard repeated as well. Um, yep. One more, Jane. I want to respect your people's time. Uh, I'm Paul Kizik from Amboy Bank. Yes. Um, I was kind of curious as to the industries that are upcoming in this particular period mm. and those that are really suffering mm. as a result of the, uh, the economy right now. Well, I mean, the, the growth in industries in New Jersey in terms of employment have been health care, very large job growth, and that's everything from uh, low skill to high skill. The whole health care industry is, is doing very well. Uh, leisure and hospitality up till recently has been growing strongly because of consumer spending. Uh, retail, logistics, warehousing, distribution are coming from the big flow of, of imports and exports out of the ports. Uh, they're doing well. Personal services of all types. Finance has picked up certainly with, with the bull market the last couple of years. How this will, the, you know, the subprime thing will ultimately play out in that sector. Citibank has recently you know, announced uh, reductions and there may be more that follows. Uh, those are the in the, those are the in the private sector that have done well. Construction uh, held up pr very well with uh, the housing boom, and it's it's starting to see some some decline in terms of employment as you might expect. But commercial office space has picked up a little of the slack, and we have a big school building construction program in the public sector. Uh, that's the profile. On the negative side. Negative side has been in in pharma. You see Bristol Myers Squibb's announcement uh, today. Uh, not clear how that will affect New Jersey, but that's been that's been occurring. So some slower growth there, certainly not what it was, and, and actual declines with a number of the major players. Manufacturing continues to decline. Manufacturing has declined in the state since 1969. That was the peak employment year for manufacturing employment. It's continued to decline, down about 317,000 jobs. Very, very difficult uh, to be competitive anymore. Well, thank you. That's our last question, but I'm sure you can catch Dr. Seneca. We'll take about a 10-minute break. I want to give you a gift and say thank you for coming today. Thank you very much. We had a dinner party. You have four uh, of these, right? Four. We hope you enjoyed this presentation by the New Jersey Bank Marketing Association. If you have comments or suggestions about these video podcasts, please send us an email. The address is steve at professionalpodcasts.com. You can also send us an audio comment by calling 856-861-6146. We produce these programs in the studios of Professional Podcasts in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. For the New Jersey Bank Marketing Association, this is Steve Lubetkin. Thank you for joining us, and take good care.
we've lost a few members to, uh, to maybe a break, but should we get started or sure. wait? If you take your seats, we'll get started again. Peter tells me he just opened his bank in May, but it, it feels like he's been there a long time. It is the sizzle of Princeton. I happen to live there and uh, sort of added a little excitement to town, so thank you. He, uh, Peter Crowley is our next speaker. He's the president and CEO of the Bank of Princeton. He spent 25 years as a senior banking executive working in, in all various aspects of commercial, retail, and investment banking. And it's fun to see a bank president that has experienced all that. Um, he was a senior vice president of Bank of America's commercial middle market banking. He was responsible for leading the Bank of America's professional service business in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. Um, I think it'll be fun to, to watch Bank of Princeton, and I welcome you today and see what's going, what you have on the, the calendar for 2008. Thanks, Jane. Thanks for inviting me to, to speak. Um, in thinking about what to talk about, uh, I'm not a marketing person, and I'm clearly not an economist. And John uh, covered that as, as well as uh, Dr. Seneca. But what I thought I tried to do is maybe give you an idea of what we went through in the last year and a half putting together our, our bank, why we did it, why the business climate, uh, climate that we have now made it advantageous to us, and a little bit of uh, sort of behind the scenes of what we went through uh, to get to where we are today, which is uh, open for going on eight months. Uh, we'll open our second branch in um, Pennington, which is sort of the western part of our market uh, in about two weeks. We'll open our third branch, which will be Hamilton in April, May, uh, March, April, which is sort of the eastern side of our, of our market. And then we're going to sort of fill in over the next couple of years. So I thought it might make some sense just to give you an idea of what we went through. Um, also, in my discussion with other DeNovo Bank presidents and CEOs, there are some consistent traits that go through what we, what we find as being the issues and the challenges that a DeNovo Bank goes through uh, in both the business climate and, in fact, in the, the fact of getting ourselves set up. So if I can do this here, let's see if I can do as good as John. Now, you notice John had good slides, color slides. That's the mar they got a marketing guy. In a DeNovo Bank, when I turn around, I'll be the marketing guy. When I turn around, I'll be the president. When I turn around, I'll be the cleaner. So in a de novo bank, you really understand, you know, how impactful multiplicities of what you do are, and everybody who works for us has the same issues. So where do we start? Um, any good plan starts with the design. And in, in our market, Princeton had a very unique opportunity. There were four uh, very well-known community banks 10 to 15 years ago. And clearly in the last 10 to 15 years, they have all been purchased. Um, and they weren't purchased because they weren't doing well. They were purchased because they were doing well. And in Princeton, it's very unique. There are restrictions for new banks coming in. So a lot of the banks that wanted to open up in Princeton had to buy a bank to, to get going. And they were bought by regional banks, and then they were bought by national banks. So what you now have is our main street going down through Princeton, starting with Chase on one end, with Bank of America, PNC, Wachovia, ending with Commerce on the other end. So there were no community banks. And we thought the market really cried out for the ability for a community bank to come in and, and, and start moving forward. The challenge that we looked at is, as John sort of alluded to, in the last uh, 20 years, banking has changed dramatically. There were 15,000 some odd number of FDIC insured banks in 1987. I went back a little farther than John did. But there's about 8,000 today, so half of them are gone. But the branch side of the business has increased dramatically. There's 90,000 branches. So what we saw was a continued focus on large banks branching out, removing uh, local decision makers, and almost removing the fact of you know who you were banking with. So what we looked at when we started was, you know, what was the key drivers of our market opportunity? And, and we found household income was clearly the biggest driver for us in the Princeton marketplace. Uh, it's sort of a homogeneous region between west out to Pennington, Montgomery, the Windsors, and then the Hamilton side, which you get a little more blue collar, um, those all were the key drivers for us. The population dynamics are pretty stable down in our market. We don't have um, tremendous changes. We've got a sort of a floor on some of the housing market because of the um, companies that are down there, Merrill Lynch, uh, Bristol Myers Squibb, and other pharmaceutical companies. Plus, Route 1, as well as some of Route 31 in Hamilton, has really become a, a catalyst for professional service firms and for high technology firms. So we felt that was a real opportunity for us. 
Um, we also look at the economic and market conditions. And, you know, you're never going to know when is the best time to pick a bank to open it. But we did see a market that was going to be contracting a little bit. We didn't think it would contract as quickly. We did not anticipate the subprime market being this much of a problem. But we did see a market where we thought there'd be a, some, ch some change in the market. And as John alluded to, um, we had Yardville and PNC in an in-bank, in-market in merger, which is the highest correlation for a de novo bank to acquire new business. If you're going to look to say, what's the best way for a de novo bank to start, be in a market where there's an in-market bank acquisition. Because if it's out-of-market acquisition, clients tend to stay um, with that particular bank and may make a decision later on. And in-market really poses challenges because in many cases the acquiring bank has um, been exposed to customers before, and customers, for whatever reason, may have not chosen to go that way. So uh, this, we think, is one of the key drivers. And you know, we're not sure what's going to happen with the merger with TD North and Commerce. But again, those are things that help a de novo bank. The toughest thing we faced when we were looking to start was how do you get a client to come on over? Because uh, you don't want to be living on a price uh, a benefit where you're the highest rate in town, and that's what brings them over. Um, but it's constant change. And as John mentioned earlier, we don't expect that to change either. So there's a life cycle for banks. Uh, the reason why you're seeing community banks starting up, and there were 14 in 2007, is because there is this growing need for uh, personal touch, high levels of service in the banking side. Interesting enough, the challenge we found was available locations. Someone mentioned that earlier. Um, Chase comes down and drops $2 million and buys a property without blinking. Citibank comes down and drops money. Um, the Novo banks don't have that kind of money to start. So our biggest challenge to start was where are we going to locate? Um, because it doesn't make a lot of sense to locate in a very off-market location unless you've got a significant driving of, of small business. Uh, and you need traffic. So one of the challenges we face is where we locate. We're lucky we were able to locate in downtown Princeton, um, and now we've been able to locate in some very high traffic areas. So from a marketing point of view, that's a key thing that we faced. Um, go to the next step here. So how do we define, we sort of knew we wanted to start, we knew what our market was like, we had to develop our core business plan. And that was defining our bank model. We had a lot of discussions about that. What were we going to be? Uh, were we going to be a strict business bank? Were we going to be a um, internet bank? Uh, were we going to be a pure consumer bank? And, and that was a very large discussion with myself and the board for a number of years, it's, uh, months. It's easier in some ways to do one model versus the other. What you can't do is be everything to everybody because your cost to acquire, let's say you want to be a trust bank. If you want to be a trust bank, your cost to uh, your high net worth clients uh, take a different type of individual. And you don't need a lot of lower end cost folks. If you're a consumer bank, you may not need a lot of higher end cost folks. So you really had to balance that off. Um, we had to develop our growth projections. Uh, that's somewhat tricky because you can look at historical aspects of growth, uh, but it really is dependent on where you are and, and what you're going to be offering. Um, staffing needs. I'll tell you, it's uh, the interesting with the Novo Bank today is, and I'll talk about it a little bit earlier, is later, is the challenge with regulatory issues. Before you could bring your staff in and they would be customer focused. The challenge today is, is to not become back office focused uh, between all the regulatory issues that you've got to face when you're building a bank. Product development and marketing strategy were, were actually very interesting for us because you really need to carve out a competitive difference. And, you know, we've started that by having the name of the Bank of Princeton, but we're still trying to put that in. What is our competitive, what do we offer to firms that is unique? And we spent a lot of time doing that. Um, we are very fortunate in that because of the technology today uh, that banks have, we can roll remote capture out. Uh, we can roll courier programs out. We can actually roll out uh, payroll cards things that traditionally small community banks could not do. So that's become a very key part for what we're positioning ourselves in. You know, we don't have a marketing department, per se. So it really is the board of directors and, and our customers who give us a lot of feedback on what to do. Two emerging trends that we absolutely see in Denova Banking, though, in any banking, are electronic um, banking and the electronic movement of funds. Uh, it puts us on par with larger banks, and that's a challenge that in the past has been difficult to attain. So if we walk into a customer and they're at Bank of America or they're at Citibank or they're at PNC Bank, there's no competitive benefit that that bank can offer 
that we can't offer. They may have a little bit better website, they may have a little bit better um, cost structure on the remote capture, but we have that ability. So it really becomes a level playing field, and that's been a very important part of our bank going forward. Um, the next thing we sort of looked at after we built, we built that and we had that put together was we knew what we were going to do, we had our model, we knew what our unique marketing strategy was going to be is, you know, how do you raise cash? And we were very fortunate in this. Um, we were able to go out um, middle of last year with our, uh, uh, our market plan and our strategy and through a series of four sort of town meetings with local folks in the Princeton uh, region with our incorporators and directors, we did not have to go to brokers to raise money. We actually raised internally about $30 million in capital. Um, to give you an idea, five or six years ago, and I don't know if, if, if some of the people are still here. I know Barry Duval was here earlier. He got to leave. You, know, you could get a bank going pretty strongly for you know, six to $8 million. Uh, today, that's difficult because the cost of getting startups. So you really want to look at probably 12 to 15 as being a good core. And with 30, it gave us a lot of flexibility. It also gives you flexibility in your lending areas because you can lend more based on your capital. But each state had different rules. The thing that we found was interesting was in New York State, if you raise capital, you have 90 days to raise it. If you don't raise your money in 90 days, you can't open. In New Jersey, you have a lot more time to do that. But if you tell someone you're going to raise $15 million as your minimum capital, you cannot raise that, but you raise 13, they won't let you open. So you have to really think this process through of how you're going to arrange, arrange for money. Um, in this whole process, uh, as you establish your capital goals and raise capital, your shareholders and your directors become absolutely important. So if you're thinking of de novo banking, when you start, that core of people, and it's, it was 20 people in our cases, became our driver to bring in that capital. And it became our most efficient channel to both outreach our bank, and then once we opened, to outreach for customers coming in. So that money coming in from them and that referral network is just absolutely key. Um, so then we decided the next case was, you know, what kind of charter do you have? And the charter we chose was a state charter. Most banks today are choosing state charters. The reason being is you're not in the bottom of the pecking order if you go for an OCC charter. Uh, and actually the state, uh, because their funding laws have changed, are more apropos to work with you today and really provide a, be a partner with you as opposed to, to fighting you. So what we found is you still have to become FDIC insured. So there's still a long and lengthy process of due diligence. Uh, it takes about six months to go through all the due diligence that these um, organizations put you through. Each director, each incorporator, each officer of the bank uh, has to be vetted. And I'll tell you, they go back, uh, for me, almost 20 years and checked where I went to high school, where I went to college, things I did. Uh, and if you have a blemish on your mark, you will not be with that bank. That's one of the things the FDIC in the state is very keen on. They uh, are very focused on there has been a lot of DeNova banks starting up in the last couple of years, and there was a concern from the FDIC, I believe, uh, that there wasn't a lot of talent going in. It was just people going in with banks uh, because it was the thing to do. They've been very careful on that. Um, planning your approach to regulatory oversight. Absolutely key. If you're going to be doing a bank today, or even of you who are with smaller banks, regulatory oversight is the absolute 800-pound gorilla. If you don't put effort against it, if you don't put time against it, it will absolutely kill you. We've had three, uh, two visitations from the state in our first seven months. We've had one visitation from the FDIC. These are not full audits, but they come in and say, are you in the right track? Are you doing things well? And they will tell you, if you don't work on your BSA, on your anti-money laundering, your Patriot Act areas, they will give you a memorandum of understanding or close you down. Forget how profitable you are or how well you're doing. So absolutely key you do that and go and, and go forward to make that a part of what you're doing. And then what's your, what's your physical infrastructure? Who's your core processor, which is the key guts behind the bank? And your training, how are you going to get the people trained once you bring them in? Um, staffing, product mix, and technology. So those are all the key things that you find in building that infrastructure of the bank. So when you're open, which is what you get, we did in uh, May, after 10 months of fundraising, of building, of reaching our milestones, you get to look and struggle against the challenges of, you know, how do you grow your assets? How do you maintain your margin? John mentioned margin is shrink, uh, shrinking. It actually is. We're finding the larger banks who we really challenge to bring balances, uh, challenge their customers to come to us, have artificially kept their deposit rates high because they don't want to lose, lose their balances. So it makes it tougher for banks like ourselves. 
you struggle with net income versus profitability. You know, do you become profitable sooner, or do you put the investment into your bank to become profitable later, build your, build your market value and your franchise value? Uh, how do you fund your loan opportunities? You clearly can do it from deposits, but if you're not going to get deposits, do you go out and borrow from the Federal Home Loan Bank Board? Do you borrow from a correspondent bank? And, and those are issues that we have to face ongoing, especially in scenarios where it's tougher to raise deposits. Market volatility helps us, I will tell you. What we have found is no one wants to ride that white knuckle roller coaster back and forth. So uh, we have found individuals that I'm just tired of the market. I want a safe investment. I want to know the community bank, and that's where we're finding some of our opportunities. And again, I mentioned earlier, you have to have your shareholder and director involvement driving what the, that business forward. If you don't, you're going to have problems. Again, I just want to touch on one of our first year challenges was regulatory oversight. Um, we've had internal auditors, we've had external auditors. There's cost to that you don't normally anticipate. Uh, at least I didn't anticipate when I started going on this. There's compliance. We had, you know, we've hired a compliance officer full time after six months because we've grown so fast. We'll be probably at seven, uh, 65, 68 million dollars in assets after seven months. Um, one point here, risk rating criteria. If you ever get involved in starting up at Denova Bank, the biggest challenge is not putting the system and regulatory in, it's maintaining it. It's every day going in, every week going in, and that's what the FDIC is going to look for. Not did you put the structure in, are you maintaining it on an ongoing basis? Now, you're doing all this while you're also trying to build balances, grow your deposits, and keep your customers satisfied. It's a challenge, so trust me. But there were key lessons learned. That, that we came through in, in our first seven months. And, and I will tell you, the, the biggest thing we learned is people are our most important asset. Um, we have uh, 17 people that work in the bank right now. They do 34 jobs. It's, it's unbelievable what they do. And uh, it's a tribute to what they, their passion for community banking. Uh, don't try to accomplish everything. Um, probably the biggest thing that caused banks to be running in too many directions. Understand what you're going to do, focus on it, and don't diverge from that path. Celebrate when you get a chance. There, there's not a lot of time to celebrate. So we make a point of um, trying to find ways to thank our, our, our customers for one, but our staff for another. And just recognize that, you know, we're working so hard 12 hours a day, step back and realize how much we've done. Have a long-term marketing strategy, but be willing to change it. That's absolutely key. You can't get stuck in that rut that this is where we're going to go, come hell or high water. You have to make that strategy change. Realize everyone you meet is a potential customer. And boy, I'll tell you, it's like running your own business when you do this. Uh, if you're at a, an event in the evening, if you're going for coffee in the morning, you're selling your bank, and our staff sells their bank too. Uh, John mentioned customer service. It's gotten tougher because the larger banks clearly are looking at being customer service focused. The good news is, in our mind, is the more electronic they become, the more remote they become, the easier it is for us to be involved in the community. And lastly, if you're going to ever go into a community bank, exhibit a passion for it. I will tell you, I've been in big banks and, and, and smaller banks. Um, boy, you, you live this. You absolutely live it day in and day out. And if you don't like that, don't do it. If you find that you have that passion for the community and the passion for people, I think community banking, once you've been exposed to it, especially with the changes going on in large banks today, and uh, it's a great way to go. And we've found that um, most of our clients, and again, we've got about, uh, give or take, 800 accounts in the first six, six or seven months probably 500, 450 clients because of multiple account holders, um, are now becoming our biggest advocate and referring people. We had our, it's funny, you little, take little successes and I'll end with this. I had a call yesterday from a brand new company, I won't tell you where because Jane's going to get mad, it's close to her, uh, who called and said, um, yeah, gee, we're looking for a brand new bank, they're spinning off from a company. Uh, we heard about you, someone mentioned you, I'd like to talk to you. When can you get there? I said, where are you and I'll be there in 20 minutes. And, and that's community banking. And uh, you know, we'll bring you the decision maker to make the decision. We basically sat down, signed off on what he wanted. He said, that was pretty easy. And I said, that's the way we try to make it. So that's community banking. Uh, that's sort of our story uh, and what we went through as a, as a, a bank in the last year and a half. And uh, thank you very much for giving me your time. I appreciate it. <laughs> any questions, again, you know, you, you, any questions, please? Uh, What was the name of that bank? That, I'm that not going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I, I've heard a lot of stories about community banks being started over the years, but what, what was the driving force in starting your bank? Was it the people with the cash, the money who wanted to create a bank, or was it uh, how did the idea start? It's interesting. The idea started by two different groups coming together. One was a group coming out of the first Washington uh, Fulton merger, where some of the directors had left and said, gee, you know, uh, we want to start a bank, and Princeton was a good market to do it. They lived in Princeton. There was also a second group who had owned some property in Princeton that was be that they were trying to build a jazz club, believe it or not, uh, didn't go through, and all of a sudden the owner, the gentleman who had come out of Warburg Pincus in New York, who was our chairman now, had about four banks called where they wanted to buy his property. And sort of, what do you want for it? We'll give it to you. He said, well, that's sort of crazy. You know, why do they want it? What's with banking? And he happened to know the other gentleman, and within a month or two, they got together, sort of combined their, their resources, um, and uh, that's how it started. It was interesting. And, it was, and the unique thing was, people had tried to build a bank in Princeton the last 10 years, but they were not Princeton individuals. They were always outside coming in for the wealth management side of Princeton. Uh, this was our 10 directors um, and our 20 incorporators. The 10 directors were all live in Princeton, or Princeton, Montgomery, that area. Um, the incorporators live within 10 miles of Princeton. So it was a very local group, and they did have a large amount of capital to start with. From the time that you thought of this idea of opening a de novo till the time that you actually opened the doors, what amount of time did you spend? Uh, we started, uh, I left to come over as the president in um, May of 06. We opened in May of 07, a year. That was quick. That, that was yeah. quick. Uh, just under your regulatory applications alone, I would have thought it would have taken longer than that. Regulatory took, we, we, we put our application in probably in July, and we got approval in uh, February from, from sort of start to finish. And um, we were very lucky because there, there was a number of banks in the queue in front of us, but there was a, a focus on getting them all accomplished by the end of last year. Uh, and we heard that people that came in after us are finding it longer. And the FDIC is not working as fast. But there was some degree to get everything done by the end of 06, get them all locked up, and we were the last ones to go in that group. How you doing? We're doing pretty good, actually. Um, you know, the biggest challenge, the biggest challenge, as John mentioned, is how do we, how do we keep growing our deposit base to fund our loans? And, you know, we're in a unique market that we're the only community bank in Princeton right now. And there's some very good community banks to our east and our west. Maybe we'll learn in the next two years as we expand how good we're going to work with them. But uh, right, right now, it's a matter of you know, just getting a deposit base and hoping the larger banks stop paying these artificially high rates to maintain deposits. With that, thank you very much. I appreciate everybody staying. I just want to thank both John and, and Peter. And we have gifts over here for you, so you can remember your memorable morning. And uh, thank you both very much. Thank you.